Well, th thank you so much for, for having me. And it's great to see uh, uh, everyone on, the, on, the, on this call. And uh, I'd love to uh, share um, my uh, presentation and uh, get, uh, get, this, uh, get this going. So I've been in the, um, the metaverse uh, space uh, since 2018. Um, and that's the first time that I, that I came through it. But uh, before that, my, um, my uh, stories of uh, Bitcoin started um, way earlier. I'm half French and half Venezuelan. And uh, in 2013, my Venezuelan mother asked me to uh, send money to Venezuela and uh, a country that had uh, high inflation and a banking system that didn't work. I needed to find a plan B. And um, after researching for many weeks and not wanting to uh, disappoint my mother, I came with the best possible option. And I say, mom, I found the, the solution. Um, um, I am going to send some Bitcoin to Venezuela. Uh, back then, Bitcoin was at $70, and uh, both my brother, sister, and her said, you know, it didn't make any sense. Uh, what was that Bitcoin thing? Uh, back then, it has, you know, it had the, the worst reputation ever, and, uh, and I realized that um, going down the rabbit hole of uh, the world economies, that there was 193 currencies in the world, and the bottom 50 already collapsed. And that you're already going to have two types of individual in this world, the people that would rely in traditional monetary systems and therefore would be the victim of inflation um, and, you know, destabilization of countries and other who would have to, to opt out. Uh, luckily for uh, uh, the charities that we sent money to in Venezuela, they did accept Bitcoin and some of them actually still kept Bitcoin years over years. And, um, and for me, it was, it was a revelation. So um, very early on, started to become a fan of blockchain technology. And, um, you know, when I tell people that, you know, when I, from the moment that I was born to now, both currencies that existed, the French francs and the Venezuelan Bolivar, um, completely collapsed. And the average lifetime span of a currency was 35 years. So when we start looking a little bit about just the history of, of currencies and the history of the world, we see that there has been a drastic evolution over the last, um, the last um, 10 years, that cryptocurrency has been the best performing asset class over the next 10 years. And I believe that the next 10 years, um, um, the metaverse is going to be where the growth relay uh, is, is going to be. And when I read that the Goldman Sachs reports talking about a trillion dollar a year uh, opportunity, um, I really believe that Web 3.0 is something that we have uh, to keep an, an interesting eye on. But uh, first, uh, let me start with the most important uh, questions. Yes, this is me uh, on, the, on the YPO uh, side for the last three years. Uh, a lot of people will tell me, well, I've known you from somewhere in YPO. I just can't picture it. It's probably from uh, the, the actual uh, website itself. It is not a mock picture from Getty Image. And no, I didn't get any benefits from YPO to put my face on it for three years. That picture was actually uh, taken in Cape Town uh, back in the days. Um, so uh, for those YPOs uh, in, uh, in, in the call, um, well, now you can put a, a, a voice to, uh, to the face. Uh, so how did my journey actually start it? Well, um, in 2013, uh, I needed to find, you know, who actually knew about, about Bitcoin in the space. And I spent many months meeting every, every single person that had access to, to Bitcoin, including those uh, who, you know, years later, six years later, were all uh, featured on the, on the cover of Forbes magazine. That was actually mid-2013. Bitcoin was at that point at uh, about $100, um, so just a little bit later than, um, you know, my first transactions. That's uh, Matthew, who's the largest Bitcoin holder in America. And, uh, and he's the first person that really I sat down with and tried to understand. And my whole focus was asking him over and over the same questions. You know, Bitcoin is, you know, it's a Ponzi scheme. Bitcoin is for, uh, you know, money launderers. Bitcoin is for drug dealing. The government is going to shut it down, et cetera, et cetera. And then I realized that, you know, between what people, the professionals in the space knew about it and were telling me about the technology and telling me, you know, the, the, the way that this was going to 
um, you know, potentially change the world versus was I was I was reading in the press, I realized that there was some major discrepancy. And when I saw that discrepancy, I thought, well, there's actually might be an opportunity there. So either um, all these people who are some of them, the smartest guys in the room uh, are completely wrong about it. And these are very early adopters of the Internet and technology, et cetera. Either it's going to be the mass market who's actually, you know, right, and you know they're going to prove them them wrong. So, but after studying it for a while, I've I've realized that you know there was an asymmetric bet that you know potentially it was going to be a, a store of value for the world, and it would have the chance to continue growing and being massively adopted, uh, and new um, you know variances of it or alteration of it was going to be um, born from from that technology. Uh, or it was going to be completely disappear, disappear. But following it, if something was actually a Ponzi scheme, if something was due to disappear, it when it crashes 80%, it actually crashes to zero and never reappears again. And for some reasons, there was always resistance of the network effect actually not only holding to a certain level, but at the same time, you know, coming back and coming back in, in a very more, more powerful way. And... Um, which led me to my my um, first venture within the space was, was actually Bitcoin mining. So um, when I actually um, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to accept Bitcoin as a mode of payment on certain you know websites that I had and certain companies that I had. Um, and then after that, I started actually saying, well, actually, why would I? you know, try to sell products except in Bitcoin, which right back then represent a very, very small business where I can actually mine uh, for $400 a Bitcoin. Um, so I started to buy machines in China, plugging into the cheapest cost of electricity in the US. Uh, so it started in, you know, Las Vegas, Washington State, Texas, and, um, and plugging these machines and producing as passive incomes uh, Bitcoin. So we produce Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, um, Ethereum, and, and a few other coins itself. And back then, the only other people that would come actually visit the facility were other Venezuelans who understood the problems with their own country and monetary policy. So this is like a, a Venezuelan friend that came over and says, wow, you know, I actually understand the value of it. And if we can, you know, produce Bitcoin at $400, not only are we going to be able to use it from an everyday expense, but there's a potential that it actually um, goes up uh, with time. And for those on the YPO President's Program, that was a presentation that I did in uh, 2016, um, where I was ex explaining actually how to, how to mine it, how to plug it, uh, moving it from Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash. And when you actually see on the table itself, it actually brought a mining equipment, the actual machines, to show what an S19 machine was looking like. Because the first question back then was, oh, well, mining is actually, um, you know, kind of, you know, gold mining with like, a, you know, like just, just the, the traditional way. So I had to actually bring a machine to actually show that it was computer linked to the cheapest cost of electricity and validating the, the transactions uh, around. So Bitcoin was, I would say, the core of or the inventor or the first you know um, minimum viable product of the blockchain itself uh, still represents right now about you know a little less than 50 percent of the overall market cap uh, within the industry a little less than a trillion dollars on an industry that's about 2.3 trillion dollars and then you know uh, back then was a far larger you know percentage and um, and then from there you know other um, uh, protocols were born, second uh, of them all being, um, being Ethereum. And now that leads us to the metaverse. So what is the truth? Like, how do I link what happened with, with Bitcoin and the, state, the history of Bitcoin with the history of the metaverse itself? Well, the metaverse is actually a, a, a term that was created in 1992 in that book called Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. And that was the first time that that concept of metaverse uh, came about. Uh, in more you know, recent history, Steven Spielberg in his uh, um, you know, blockbuster movie Ready Player One uh, was the Hollywood version of the metaverse. He actually called it uh, the Oasis. And, um, and that world in 2045 where people would just put their virtual reality headsets and be sent to another world where they, can, they could be 
whatever they wanted to be. And in the first book, the Neil Stevenson book, actually the hero is the book is a, is a pizza delivery guy in the real world who's actually some kind of you know, knight or soldier uh, in the metaverse world. And I think that that fascination um, and that you know, metaverse world is what actually draws a lot, of, a lot of people, is that how to actually build something uh, where you know, the only limit is, uh, is your imagination. So when we look at the history of, of the web, we're seeing that we are entering the, the third phase. Um, so obviously we went from the web 1.0 web, which was read only. It was decentralized, it was read only. It was, you know, you can see your news, you can see the information, you didn't really interact with it. But that was the first version. You know, the logo as we recognize it is the Netscape logo. And that basically gave us, you know, democratize the access to the, to the internet. So thinking about the AOL page and the Yahoo first page, that was the one, web 1.0. Then we arrive into the 2.0, which is read, write, read and write. So that was it. So I could actually see news, but I could interact as well. So this is, you know, kind of the, 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 the first, you know, born of the network effect. So uh, the Facebook of this world, the Google of this world, uh, communities that are being built and very centralized communities that became a winner takes all. So it's like, you know, the first market cap of these companies is a trillion dollars. The second market cap is $25 million. Everybody kind of gravitated around um, one, um, you know, one platform that just had uh, mass appeal. And now we're entering uh, the third phase uh, of the internet, which is the blockchain phase. Uh, so this is about read, write, and own. The ownership inside of the web. So there's a lot still, um, um, you know, I wouldn't call it a misunderstanding, but uh, um, a lot of um, doubts about owning things that are virtual. So, but when you look at the, you know, five biggest companies in the world, they're all virtual companies. And now you can see even in web 2.0, people spend more time curating their pictures on their, you know, Instagram than actually the way that they look in the real world. Or, you know, what is the value of being a blue check on the Instagram? You know, some people would say, well, that defines their business, the fact that they're verified on these, on the, on these platforms. But now with blockchain technology, we have the capacity to actually share items that have value. Bitcoin being one of one, being one of them. Um, obviously, you have utility tokens like Ethereum. And then more recently, NFTs. Uh, which is one of a kind of pieces that offer certain members, certain, you know, um, benefits that also uh, can be traded. And when you look at it, you also see that it's a generational thing. There's, you have the Gen Z category right now that were born with the internet. They understand that digital things have actually value. And I think that the world is going to be, the internet world is going to be rebuilt on the blockchain and it's going to be built um, in a more flat type of organizations where it's not going to be one person that's, you know, you know, is worth $100 billion and then everybody gets the product for free. Now you're in a situation mm. where network effects are sharing the value that they create um, between them. So um, the first, um, um, when I looked at, at Bitcoin as a store of value, I looked at it and says, okay, it's going to disrupt the $10 trillion gold uh, gold market. Like that's the market that it's going after. And it's going to be gold for millennials, uh, gold 2.0, as we call it. But when we think about it, the biggest store of value in the world is real estate. Real estate is $350 trillion industry, 35 times the size of gold. And um, the first time where I actually heard about the term metaverse as an investment um, was in early 2018. The platform that I invested in, uh, who became the largest market cap uh, within the space and where I became uh, the corner and, uh, and the largest landowner within the space, um, within the metaverse, decentralized metaverse space, um, uh, had just started at the moment. And then we realized that what there's 90,000 parcels of land each parcels of land 
is an NFT itself has a value because it's a limited number of parcels. You cannot create one more, the, fact, the same way that you can not create uh, one more Bitcoin. It's capped at 21 million. But on top of that, you can actually create business on top of it. So not only does it has a store of value element, but also you can actually operate a business on top of it. And this is an interesting video. It's a five minute video that the Wall Street Journal um, you know, has been, uh, has been putting together that had almost a million views. And uh, would love to share it with everybody because it, um, it shares, um, it gives a little bit more insights about uh, the benefits of, uh, of the metaverse and, and, uh, and uh, virtual real estate. The latest big real estate market isn't on scenic coastlines or in major cities. It's in the metaverse where a growing number of investment firms are spending millions to acquire digital property. Owning land now in the metaverse is a little bit like buying land in New York 250 years ago. Metaverse real estate isn't all that different from property in the real world. It just exists digitally in 3D cities where users can simulate real life pursuits like shopping, playing games, or attending virtual concerts. There are houses that you can walk into, there are shops that you can go into and buy things. Uh, and this real estate in the metaverse is increasingly for sale. The idea behind investing in digital land is that once you own it, you can make money by developing virtual property and leasing it out. We bought it because we want to do something very big there. We want to do something that's immersive and exciting. And in order to do that, you have to have lots and lots of space. Of course, digital real estate is still considered a very risky investment. So what exactly led to this virtual land boom? and what factors make it so valuable. Right now, the metaverse is an evolving space that comprises multiple digital worlds where users can interact with avatars. Many of these digital spaces appear cartoon-like, while others feel like virtual recreations of the real world. Andrew Kegel is the CEO and co-founder of Tokens.com, an investment firm specializing in cryptocurrency and metaverse real estate acquisitions. Land in the metaverse looks a little bit like a monopoly board in that you have these parcels of land and you want to try to acquire as many parcels of land on the monopoly board. There are only a few platforms where investors can buy and sell real estate, each with their own unique cryptocurrencies. Each platform has a limited number of parcels available for purchase, which is tracked using blockchain technology. In November, Republic Realm, a firm that buys and develops real estate in the metaverse, said it paid $4.3 million for land in the world of Sandbox. It's the largest digital property sale publicized to date. The whole reason why it is a store of value is because at the outset, each metaverse platform declares exactly how many parcels there will be. So they would be cannibalizing the value of their own holdings if they continued to mint more and more of it. So that that tenet of scarcity is what gives the category value. As in the physical world, location is a major factor to consider when buying digital land. Areas that are busier or have more visitor traffic, like the downtown areas, the parcels of land that are for sale there would be worth more than those that might be in the suburbs. Once you have this parcel of land, you can use various programming tools to create things like an amusement park, a casino, a museum, you can build whatever you want. Investors are betting that individuals and companies will spend money on virtual developments like homes and retail space. And as more people join these online worlds, the properties will increase in value. You know, if you build a mansion, you might sell it to someone who's very wealthy and wants to spend thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars on a mansion in the metaverse. Or if you build a mall or an office tower, you're gonna you're gonna lease out the space to companies and you're gonna collect rents. Tokens.com said it paid $2.5 million for attractive land in Decentraland's fashion district. Decentraland is a 3D decentralized virtual world that was launched in 2017. The long-term vision is that we want to turn that property that we've purchased there into the Rodeo Drive or the Fifth Avenue of the metaverse. Our goal is to be the dominant and leading metaverse landlord. Companies pay an architect to design virtual homes or malls and a game developer to build them. Zoning rules limit what and where a company can build in the metaverse. But unlike the real world, metaverse buildings can defy the laws of physics. 
it. So there's a point in the development cycle where it looks nearly identical to real world real estate development. So you hire an architect, you come up with a mood board, you pull images of other, other spaces and buildings and designs you like, and you figure out what it is you're going to build. And then from that point forward, it actually turns into video game development. So then you hand it off to 3D renderers and then to 3D developers who make it interactive. Some of Republic Realm's developments include a virtual mall, which it leases to retailers selling fashion for avatars, as well as a master planned community of around 100 villas on private islands that it sold to individuals. So in some ways, these immersive e-commerce environments that we're building are really 3D equivalents of marketplaces like Amazon, like Etsy, where multiple different sellers and, and retail products or experiences can be in one place but not have to build all the tech themselves. Advertising and brand partnerships are another enticing aspect of metaverse real estate. Investors anticipate a future in which digital property owners can work with brands that want a presence in these growing digital worlds. Because this is not just an opportunity to continue to build their brand, but it's a way to introduce their brand to a whole new demographic of people that are young gamers into crypto and all these types of things. Of course, investing in digital properties is still very risky and highly speculative. Unlike in the real world, the value of virtual properties could plunge if the world they are in loses popularity and people stop visiting it. Prices can also be slammed by the volatility of cryptocurrencies. It's really a third derivative investment of crypto, highly volatile, highly speculative. But the reason people are drawn to it is precisely for that reason, because there is the potential for outsized returns and that volatility is what they came for. In order to reduce that risk, investors are buying land in a number of different virtual worlds. Republic Realm, for example, says it owns more than 3,000 plots of digital land across 24 different worlds. If you bought crypto five or 10 years ago, you're a very rich person now. And people see that and they're looking for other things like that to replicate that growth. And so all these other blockchain based investments, including metaverse real estate, are appealing to people for that reason. Interest in the metaverse and the properties within it accelerated as people spent more time online during the pandemic. It got an even bigger boost after Mark Zuckerberg announced Facebook's name change to Meta Platforms Incorporated reflecting the company's focus on creating online worlds in the metaverse. I think the, the, the light bulb just went off in a lot of people's minds and said, hey, this is something that's going to continue to appreciate and appreciate quickly if the trend of people congregating in these environments continues to grow. According to the digital currency investor Grayscale, the global market for goods and services in the metaverse will soon be worth $1 trillion. So the next generation of tech users, which is why Mark Zuckerberg anticipated this and renamed his company. They're going to require from technology an experience that's 3D and immersive, and they are not going to be content with their parents' social media or e-commerce experiences, which are 2D and about scrolling. They're going to want to go meet their friends in what we now call a metaverse, where they can interact in a way that feels much more human and much more normal. The latest so when we look at the at the size of opportunity, and this is for me um, a, a big uh, a big area of, of focus on to say, okay, wh where should we be within the next you know two, five, ten years? Uh, let's look first on the right. Web 2.0 metaverse style, we're talking 15 trillion dollars. Where we are with web 3.0 metaverse. We're at $300 billion. So we see the potential growth of that market. Not only the growth, this is in today's environment. I believe one of my key things is that people will continue spending time on the internet. And in fact, people are going to spend more and more time on the internet and trade more and more. So the pile not only is going to grow bigger and bigger, but also if we believe in the theory that Web 2.0 is going to be rebuilt in Web 3.0, which is the natural evolutions, when you have a better technology using blockchains within the next you know, five years, um, I believe that there's going to be a lot of bridges between Web 2.0 and Web 3.0, and that 300 billion might be uh, much, much higher. Even when we compare it to Facebook, I mean, Facebook changed its name to Meta 
because of the threat of the Web 3.0 metaverse. And let's and look, let's look, we're looking at 30, it's 30 times bigger, one company is 30 times bigger than the entire industry in itself. So we're still at its infancy level right now with a very, very strong uh, opportunity for, um, for growth. Early one action and early decision. Catalyst of that of that movement was obviously exactly a year ago. This is the Wall Street Journal of last year, March 12th, so a year and you know three weeks ago, um, where the Beeple auction uh, out of nowhere went for 69 million dollars. So this is an industry where nobody paid attention about the NFTs. Nobody um, believed that an NFT had any value, and then all of a sudden, not only uh, it was auctioned off by a legit 100 plus year institutions, but the market uh, was able to absorb uh, what became the third living uh, artist uh, of, of all times. Uh, or the first living artist uh, at, at the moment. And this actually, that picture doesn't really give it justice, but that Beeple uh, collage is actually 5,000 images, one next to each other. So Beeple, the, the artist, had what did one um, digital image. Latest big real estate market. Per, one digital image per day for uh, for 13 years. And he basically put all of them together and sold basically his lifelong you know, work for, um, you know, in, into, into one, one specific, uh, one specific uh, um, uh, um, uh, painting. Well, we look at the different revenue models on the metaverse itself. There's basically, I've selected four of them. There are many other ones. The first one is uh, traditional businesses actually using this as an extension uh, to capture a new audience. So for example, Sotheby's, um, what they have uh, on Decentraland uh, is exactly the copy of their London Bond Street uh, locations, where you can actually, your avatar can go in it, look at the walls, looking at the different auctions coming up. Um, you see actually on the, on, the, on the left, the image is actually a CryptoPunk, which is the second largest um, NFT projects in terms of, of value uh, that is on, on, the, on the forefront. And it gives an experience, an immersive experience when you actually go and, and, and visit it. Uh, the picture on the right, Binance, which is the largest exchange in the world, kind of have their futuristic headquarters where they can educate people about buying and selling cryptocurrencies. Um, on the bottom right, you have a Festival Land, uh, which is a venue where you can have concerts. So on December 31st, they had um, Dead Mouse, a very famous DJs, um, you know, doing, uh, doing an event. Uh, people can actually buy tickets as NFTs to attend the event. During the event, you can actually buy T-shirts of the um, virtual T-shirts of the, uh, of the, the, the performance. Um, and you can gather with your friends from all of all over the world into uh, into one single locations. And then on the on the left, you have um, wearables. Wearables is a very very big and growing category. Last week on the Central Land, you had the first Fashion Week, uh, where you had brands like Tommy Hilfiger, uh, Eli Saab. Uh, you had about a dozen brands. We were actually responsible for Dolce Gabbana, so we did the, all the wearables for uh, for Dolce Gabbana for that um, for that event, and um, and we see that wearables are not only important but a necessity because your avatar need to actually have clothes and you know to be walking around. Now you're going to say, well, what is really the benefits? Well, for example, when we did the um, uh, Australian Open. Um, activation, uh, you had a very famous DJ who closed the party. So you had the Steve Aoki party. And um, in order to get into that party, you needed to buy a t-shirt from that artist to have access to be on the DJ booth with him and to have access to that, to that event. Um, the same thing is happening with casinos. There is a bunch of casinos within our land. Uh, in order to get into the poker room, you need to actually get a t-shirt of that uh, collection of that poker room. And who uh, so there you can have somebody who buys the t-shirts, rents it out to, um, to a poker player. He plays all night. 
and you get 30% of the profit that he's making just by the fact that he's wearing your t-shirts. So you had more than 8,000 people who quit their jobs to basically play full-time uh, poker on the virtual world. Now, when you think about countries where you know, don't have the same opportunities as some other westernized city, that is real, like a real job and a real revenue models that you know, they didn't have uh, even a few, a few months ago. So these are two projects that um, uh, we've been working on. The first one of the left is the number one NFT project in the world called uh, Borde Yacht Club. So we were their tech partner, so their blockchain developers. So uh, everything from tokenizations to smart contracts to legal aspects to uh, exchanges, et cetera. This is a $5 billion uh, franchise, 10,000 NFTs. Right now, the floor price of a board ape is 105 Ethereum, which is about three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. You probably saw that, you know, scrolling out on Twitter and Instagram, the picture of the the apes. Um, so when Board Ape came um, came and see us, they said, "Well, we want to launch a token." So two weeks ago, um, for those uh, who re who read the Financial Times, on the cover of the Financial Times, uh, there was a there was you know uh, the name of our firm uh, mentioned as it was the most successful token launch in in history. Uh, it went from zero to fifteen billion dollar market cap in uh, less than an hour. Uh, so fifteen billion dollars of value creations. Every board ape owner got a wire transfer at one hundred forty thousand um, uh, dollars as being you know part of the uh, of of the group. It was done under a DAO model, decentralized autonomous organizations, um, and these NFT. Um, collections, this one being, you know, the number one by far, to the point that the number two one, CryptoPunk, got actually purchased by, by Bored Ape. But what actually is interesting is why would somebody actually buy this? Uh, by the way, this is the most expensive one, the one called Laser Eyes that sold for over a million dollars. But why do people actually buy it? Because board it's called Bored Ape Yacht Club because it was a Yacht Club membership. So you had 10,000 of you know, uh, a very influential community um, who had access to it. So it was at the beginning kind of an inside joke. And then, um, and then now it's either people who were at the beginning of that movement, either who have people who have the means to buy their way in it. So you have, you know, NBA basketball players, uh, you have, you know, pop stars, Madonna recently got one, Eminem got one, Justin Bieber got one. So all of a sudden you're in a Discord channel with all these people being part of that, of that community. You receive airdrops of other brands that are sending you, you know, new virtual art, um, uh, just to the fact that you're a board ape owner. Um, so uh, board ape is definitely the benchmark within the space, but then there's a lot more iteration around that. You have um, NFT, you have to think about utility NFTs as a membership. So for example, if you're a luxury brand and you're launching, you know, 10,000 utility NFTs, think about it like having an American Express, you know, credit card. You don't do it for the design that's on top of it. You, look, you do it for the benefits. So the benefits might be, you know, access to their, um, you know, to some of their uh, VIP events, might be access to merchandise before anybody else, might be access to uh, wearable virtual goods, uh, might be airdrops that is that are being done might be if they have a celebrity spokesperson maybe you get you know a, you know something from them directly to do your uh, ethereum wallet um, so the the declinations are, are very very wide right now we're helping uh, one of the largest entertainment venue in the u.s launching 10,000 of these nfts they're selling it for one ethereum uh, each they're going to make uh, in one day $30 million, which is more than, you know, anything that they've, you know, the profit that they have made for the last, you know, six years. Um, plus, you get a percentage of secondary sales when it's when it's uh, to that. So if somebody buys it for one Ethereum and sell it for two Ethereum, the company, the brand that has been launching it is going to take a percentage of that. So let's assume that they take 5%. They're going to make passive incomes potentially for the years to come by selling that NFT. And for the person who bought it $3,000, if they deliver on their roadmap, well, that might be worth two, three, five Ethereum. You know, Bored Ape started, you know, less than Ethereum. Today is over, you know, 100x that amount because of the community that is being built and because of the perks that people are actually getting from it. Uh, the picture on the right is um, 
is the picture of Decentraland. Um, so within this, we uh, we owned all the top left part, Vegas City, Festival Land, Decentraland Universities. We're the number one entertainment zone and the number one commercial zone in not only Decentraland, but the old metaverse. Um, we signed partnerships with companies like Unilever, BCG, Honda, big movie studios. We have 80 art galleries, five casinos, um, you know, and, and the list goes, goes on and on. Um, so that is that is what the virtual world looks like. And one of the things that is interesting, and um, I'm going to be speaking about um, an NFT Paris next week uh, on the Board ABL Club panel, but also about uh, should you lease or buy land on the metaverse? Because it's some you know real questions that brands are having. You know, should I take a bet on a neighborhood? And you know, not knowing who my neighbors are going to be, and not knowing you know what the pri future price of that piece of land, how it's going to play with, versus leasing a piece of land when I can you know where I know which area I'm going to be in, where I can manage the cost of it on a monthly basis, and then focus on my on my core business. And then finally, I would leave you with uh, with uh, a, a quote. Um, I take that from one of my uh, MBA professor who always finishes with quotes. Um, and I think that quote really resonates well with you know what is trying to be done with uh, with the metaverse. Um, I wish we were all hippies and did yoga, lived in cottages, accepted everyone for who they are, and listened to wonderful music. I wish money didn't make us who we are. I just wish we would, could redo society. And I think a lot of people who are going in the metaverse now and the metaverse, you know, back in the last in the last few years, um, they feel that they want to redo the world a certain way. They want to have a free, open uh, world. They want to be able to um, not be uh, let, you know, their imaginations. Uh, they want to be able to dress the way that they want. What is something that is often interesting is uh, when a people look like in real world versus what their avatar looks like. You have the most conservatives, kind of accounting, you know, accountant type of person. So all of a sudden you see their avatar. It's like the most flamboyant avatar that there is, you know, running around the, the metaverse. So I think it's also a place where people can express themselves, a place where they can create and build the world that they want to uh, to do. And I don't know if anybody knows who that quote is from. If you want to put it in the in the chat, if anybody knows uh, who actually said uh, the following. It's actually Bob Marley. And uh, it's actually a quote from, uh, from Bob Marley that, uh, that was mentioned about uh, 30 years ago. And with this, uh, I'm going to be uh, opening up for a question. And if anybody has uh, any com any comments, please uh, please let me know. Uh, this is my email and my and my Telegram, and uh, I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thanks a lot, Hervé. Uh, first of all, I think uh, I've seen in the chat everyone agrees it was a great presentation. Thanks for that. Thanks for you know all these uh, provocations. I think the metaverse and Web 3.0 is uh, an issue that uh, brings a lot uh, uh, of uh, questions at tone, and I think uh, I've seen many of these here in the chat. And so I'm going to actually uh, select uh, uh, some that are very relevant and also in the order. And so also I'm going to call the member who, who asked this question in case they want to open their mic. And so I wanted to start with uh, uh, Regina. Uh, Regina actually has two questions, one related to the differences between the metaverse today and uh, kind of like games like Saturn Life in the past, and the second one related to the environmental part of the uh, metaverse web 3.0 and everything. So Regina, if you would like to uh, better clarify your questions and ask them directly to Arvi, uh, feel free to open the microphone. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I call me very naive when it comes to NTS and Metaverse and Bitcoins. I'm not very a professional here, but I was really wondering because I can remember that when we started the industry with the gamification, there was already something called Second Life. Yeah, second life world where people could be avatars and walk around. And that whole business was hyped at that days as well as, you know, um, the future of, of, of e-commerce, if you want. And it didn't work out well, so it disappeared after a while. What makes you so sure that that next try here will be having a different um, journey? 
Yeah, so so a very good question. So I, I think there's there's two elements um, uh, around it. The, the first one is that we're comparing two different systems, Web 2.0 versus Web 3.0. Web 2.0 is a winner takes all type of, of situation. So some Web 2.0 company has been very successful, like Google, where Facebook, like YouTube, etc. I think that the exciting part about Web 3.0 is that we're going to a decentralized ownership. In other words, this is not a metaverse that is being controlled by somebody. Actually, Decentraland, uh, like Bitcoin, let's take Bitcoin as an example for, 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 for a second. There's no Bitcoin CEO, there's no Bitcoin company, there's no Bitcoin individuals. What is gonna make it successful is the success of the network itself. Um, so uh, you have many other companies, including big banks, that are saying, "Well, I'm going to create a better Bitcoin, that I'm going to, and I'm going to, go, I'm going to create it, and I'm going to release it, etc." When it is something that is centralized, it obeys by a different dynamic. The beauty of it all, and the beauty of Web 3.0, is the decentralization elements. So, in other words, if you build on Second Life, if you build on Facebook. It is owned by the company that you build it on. If you build on a decentralized platform, it is owned by you. So I believe, and I think it's the theory of a lot of people within the space, is that when people have financial gain or financial incentives, they have a better reason to spend time within this environment. So in other words, you have, for example, um, so, for example, uh, you know, like the NFT concept, right? Like, the, let, let's take the, the first NFT that there is, which is your domain name. If you create your domain name on Instagram, for example, that domain name is the property of Instagram or the property of Facebook. You cannot own it. You cannot sell it. You cannot, if somebody offers you a million dollars, you cannot sell it. I mean, this is the property of somebody. Um if you get the product for free, that means you're the product. And the business model is that there's going to be one person that's you know, worth $100 billion and then everybody else who's going to be the product of that, of that organization. Uh, when you look at Web 3.0, it's built on a different way. Um, so you have normally foundations or you know, protocols that were established and the success of it was the number of, of people that are coming in there. So the typical question that would arise is somebody, and each time that I speak at a conference, you have dozens of people that says, well, I'm going to build a better metaverse. You know, like that's one metaverse, but like, you know, I, I have a better metaverse that I'm going to move So there's two questions. Is the, the metaverse centralized or not? 99% of the time, it is a centralized metaverse. So then the question becomes for them, do they have a chance to beat Facebook? Do they have more than the $10 billion budget a year that Facebook puts? Do they have more than 2 billion users that Facebook has right now? Do they have, you know, the capacity to come up with a product? They might have, you know, maybe yes, maybe no. If they say, well, I'm actually going to build a decentralized metaverse, then the question becomes, how are you going to attract the network? What... Um, uh, are you willing to give any ownership rights in it? So in other words, the reason why people will buy, build on Decentraline, for example, there is no Decentraline company, it's a foundation. So the foundation created something and then released it to individuals. So you're going to be able to have it forever. It is going to be in your wallet. Your piece of land is going to be in your wallet itself. You're going to be able to make revenue from it. If the value of the land increases, then it goes directly in your pocket or in your net worth. And uh, it creates an incentive for people to actually create and, and be part of it. So we don't know where the network effects are going to be in the future. We just know that it is a different game than what has been played before with Web 2.0. And I think that from the internet to the blockchains, like that's where we're going from Web 2.0 to Web 3.0. Some people might say, hey, Web 2.0 is going to continue to be the platform of choice for the next 50 years and nothing is going to beat them. Or a lot of people believe that Web 3.0 is going to take over, that there's going to be a mass adoption of cryptocurrencies and it is going to be um, the place where the new generation actually gravitates 
uh, around Gen Z right now. If you're a student at MIT, you're not going to build a company on the internet. You're going to build a company on the blockchain right now. Like if Mark Zuckerberg was graduating today, he will build a company on the, on the blockchain. So I think that we're leaving that 20 year kind of journey of Web 2.0. And now we're entering into uh, uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Regina, for the question. Thanks, uh, Hervé, for the, the nice answer. And, and actually, you know, going uh, also in the sequence of the questions, but I think there is a very strong fit uh, with uh, actually Catherine's uh, question. She asked about uh, the profits, actually, coming from, uh, uh, you know, all these transactions in uh, the Web 3.0. So, Catherine, would you like to uh, better formulate your question to Hervé? Feel free. Yes, thank you. First of all, amazing presentation. I think it really made clear what it is all about and what uh, all the things that are possible. I learned in this uh, hour uh, very, very new things. It's, it's amazing and it's exciting. But then I think we still need a physical house to sit um, in front of our computers to do all this designing and gaming and exciting things and going to concerts and for some people that's already a challenge to have a house that protects them so it made me think about the global challenges and we can say should all the money go there maybe that's not good but I don't want to take the easy way in in putting that judgment because maybe it's so good and we want it to be super successful so that the profits can go to the ones that really need it. So the more successful you are in the metaverse, the more money can go uh, maybe to the physical world. <laughs> but I, I, I want to hear from you how uh, people are reacting um, to this topic. Well, I, I, so I think there's different questions in there, but let, let, me, let me take a crack at it. The, 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 I think the world is going more and more flat. And I think for a lot of people, um, they don't have the luxury of being in, um, you know, in some of the most uh, westernized type cities uh, where they have the opportunity to go down the street and, and to get a job. Um, but however, wherever you are in the world, you probably have a good chance of having access to the internet. And I do believe that this is going to create much more opportunities uh, for people that not only didn't have that opportunities and mostly for people, the Gen Z generations who actually now have, to have, to, have a chance to make money within the space itself. And when we're looking at our you know, small level, small level at, our, at our district, we have 8,000 people who are working full time within gaming uh, within these casinos. Uh, whether it's people giving virtual tours of the districts, whether are people who are uh, hosting events, whether are people who um, educate others about the space, uh, this is a great way um, for people to actually have in the comfort of their home, where even when they're in unsafe environment, to actually generate revenue. Um, we looked at it as well when you saw what happened in Ukraine. I saw personally more news about uh, Ukraine selling NFTs to raise money for refugees, about cryptocurrency wires uh, to help, you know, in periods of crisis, because it's a, a peer to peer type situation. Uh, when I looked at the centralized system, it was more about, hey, let's never deal with, you know, so-and-so banks, with so-and-so exchanges, everybody pulls out, we don't really care if, you know, the baby goes with the, you know, the bathwater, um, you know, we're just going to cut every ties, etc. So uh, when people are in situation and crisis, you know, we're talking about store of value, and it's often something that is being spoken in a very kind of uh, uh, philosophical way. But if you have to leave your house overnight, um, you know, for a reason X, Y, Z, 
um, you have more chances to live with a USB key, key in your pocket and a few Bitcoins and cross the border and start a new life somewhere with two Bitcoins in your pocket uh, rather than coming with, you know, the store of value, which is gold, uh, which is going to stay in the bank that is going to be closed and, you know, and lobbied for never doing business with them again. So uh, I think that um, right now, uh, when there's a situation of crisis, and I'm not talking, you know, there's obviously like lighter, uh, you know, let's call it a lighter crisis like inflation or more bigger crisis. Um, I actually believe that this is a great plan B. I mean, if I had to leave, you know, the comfort of, you know, London right now, I better start off somewhere else with a few Bitcoins and a job of the metaverse that I can do, you know, in the next city where I'm going to be in uh, the other side of the world. So uh, I, I do believe that the opportunities uh, are, are massive. And it's also, you know, the early adopters within the space who, you know, learn, learn about it. And once they learn about it, they're able to provide values to the people that are coming in. There's 6.6 million people that went on the Decentraland website um, um, last month. Um, and, you know, I think for a lot of people, it's still something new. And there's a lot of uh, value creations. I mean, just to give you another final example on a, on a lighter note, um, there was a, a festival, a music festival that was organized, and uh, uh, there was um, uh, NFTs. You needed an NFT to actually enter the festival, and the there was actually more people in the festival than NFT sold. And we realized now that we needed to hire security guards in the metaverse to control the people that were going in and out. So these are real jobs that people can actually do. They get paid directly in their wallet. And, uh, and that creates, you know, a mass opportunity that, that didn't exist, you know, even a few weeks ago. Thanks a lot, Harvey, for the, the kind answer. Thanks, Catherine, for the, for the question. I know a lot of people, you know, they have a hard stop. They're leaving the, the session and uh, a lot of, like, uh, very, very positive comments. Um, you know, Harvey, there's... Mm, other squ other questions and so that, uh, maybe we can take the freedom to forward them to you uh, and if you don't mind even uh, just on a couple of lines uh, send it back to us we're going to share it with uh, all the people that ask a lot of questions so they're very interesting uh, I will just take the chance over the last couple of minutes maybe to ask a question that I think is very relevant to each one of us uh, that are attending this uh, this call it's basically Hervé what do you think are the main questions that board members or advisors to big companies should ask themselves when basically looking at the metaverse? And if not questions, what are the main points that you feel are important for us to consider when we look at our company opportunities and threats within the metaverse? If you should provide a couple of points that we can all uh, have as takeaways. Well, one of the things that I see on an everyday basis advising, you know, large organizations is that everybody needs right now a Web 3.0 strategy. Uh, that's a real topic of conversations because there's either two ways. Either Web 3.0 is going to completely disrupt the business. Either Web 3.0 is going to enhance the business. But there need to be that discussions. If there's a marketing department, they should allocate immediately 5% of the budget in Web 3.0 to think about it, to come up. Should we do an NFT? Should we do a token? Should we have a metaverse presence? Um, should we, um, you know, you know they, there are 10 different things that, that they could do. Uh, but I think the most the, the number one element is to to actually discuss about it and to think about it and to have both internally or externally that think tank where people can actually uh, come up with, with with ideas because uh, I think that you know believing that this you know phenomenon uh, is gonna go away I, I think it's um, it's it's uh, it's it's gonna be very unlikely I think that we might that's going to continue to grow. We're still at the early levels right now. We're the equivalent of, you know, 1997 in the internet world. I mean, this is where we are right now when it relates to it. But when, you know, if we fast forward five years, 10 years, um, you know, I think that um, it's going to become, you know, did we enter it 
in 20, the question is, are we entering it in 2022, 2025, 2020, uh, 20, 2030? Um, I think that's the real question. Did that famous say in the Bitcoin world, you know, we get, um, you get Bitcoin at the price that you deserve. Um, and I think that's a little bit the same thing when it relates to other categories within the space. You know, you get the price of land uh, at the price that you deserve. Some people are going to get there in five years and are going to pay a vast premium for it, but it's fine. It's a risk reward ratio. But I think that these discussions right now in every boardrooms are happening now. Every CEO needs to have an answer with what people know. When we bid on the... Um, I remember on the uh, the Beeple NFT, uh, obviously Christie's has started through and they had a, a clubhouse talk with the CEO of Sotheby's and they were asking him, you know, oh, what is your NFT strategy? He didn't know what an NFT was. So I, I think that it was, you know, I, I think that these discussions need to actually uh, to actually happen. And um, this is something that uh, we, we work on on a daily basis. Yesterday we did a call with a, a CPG brand um, we were expecting to be a few people on it. We were 27th on a, on a conference call. I didn't even know you could be 27 on a conference call. So that most the importance of that category for, um, for, for a lot of uh, brands as a future relay of growth. Great, uh, Hervé. So basically, let's not face off and just uh, walk away from that as seeing as, you know, something very far away, but at least ask ourselves the interesting questions related to that. Um, mm -hmm. I know we're running out of time, uh, and some people who asked uh, very interesting questions left the session, but if there is time still for uh, Michel Pieston already asked, uh, it's been some time to ask a, a quick question, and if we have time, we can go with David. Uh, and the other ones are formulated within the chat. We can forward them to you uh, later on, Irving. So Michel, feel free to ask your question. Thanks, Actually, my, my question was kind of asked uh, before, it was about uh, Second Life. But I, I don't know, I, I felt there was no interest for Second Life. Like people wouldn't spend time on it. And, and if you look at the time that's been spent on uh, Instagram and other uh, social networks, could you just comment on that part of the why Second Life failed? If you don't feel like the, the interest won't be that high for Metaverse? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 the billion dollar question, right? Like, wh which you know company and protocol is is gonna is gonna fail? What 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 I can say is that um, the initial person who told me about the metaverse and who shared the thoughts about it was very very involved in Second Life, and his thought process was that um, there is now something that was lacking with Second Life was the capacity to have private ownership. And I think that the private ownership element is what makes the difference. If you're able to have your, you know, when you think about it, are you gonna spend more time building on Facebook, building on Second Life, knowing that the value creation is not gonna be captured by you, or you'd rather build in a new technology that offers you to benefit from the upside? And, and I think that this, is that question is, is the core one. And then it becomes um, the network effect that is being built. So the best analogy that I can take for either layer one platforms, either the different metaverse, I see them like cities. You know, does it mean that, you know, if LA is successful, does it mean that New York is not successful? Does it mean that, you know, if New York becomes more successful than London is not? I think that every network is like a city. New York is the most expensive real estate because in some ways they have the most powerful network. Uh, same thing could be said, you know, for, for you know, Dubai, I was, I was just there. Can somebody create a Dubai, you know, in the middle of Saudi Arabia? Yeah, hundred percent. You know, they can take a plot of land, put some buildings. Could it be more successful than Dubai? Most likely not because the network is on a specific area. So I think that that remains the big question is like which protocols, which companies are going to be successful and that there's a, there's, there's a different, there's a different, uh, there's different reasoning. But I also think that we are playing different. It's a different game that is being played. Comparing the web 3.0 game to the web 2.0, um, I think that these are two things that are that are that from a um, you know second life could have failed because 
you know, the CEO just didn't hire the right team or, you know, or wasn't at the office or the cap table wasn't right or they didn't raise enough money or they didn't see, you know, new structural changes or they didn't pivot the right way or they didn't accept brands to actually sell or they didn't want to give ownership to actually clients. So there's a million reasons why um, it, it could have failed. One of the things for sure is that the reason why a decentralized network actually might uh, the reason why it succeeds or feel is the value of the community itself. You know, you're going to need to have hundreds of thousands of people all making the wrong decisions uh, in order for it to fail. And I would say as well that what is going to happen, you're going to have bridges between metaverse. You're also, for some people, they're not going to care which metaverse they're built on in the sense that you would have on a website, let's say you're in the you know luxury goods business, you would have a, a link at the bottom of your site saying, visit us in our store in the metaverse. You would click on it. You will arrive in your virtual store and nobody will know which metaverse you're being built on. You just arrive inside of your store and you know they, they don't even care where, where it actually is, is happening. So um, I think that that private ownership makes a big difference. And I think that um, you know, then the future becomes which was the network effect uh, really applying. Now, what we see is that when a big market cap, you know, the leading market cap, like a Bitcoin and Ethereum, a Decentraland, et cetera, it tends to grow bigger. Uh, and if it stalls or if it starts failing, there's usually warning signs and it usually doesn't happen overnight. And that doesn't mean that you cannot go from one horse to the other. But once a certain number, once 200 million, it's Metcalf's law, right? It's like when two, when, you know, you have one telephone, it's not worth anything. When you have two is actually, you know, two square. When you have three is actually, you know, two uh, exponential three. So that, that is actually what is the core of it. So if you have a platform where you have 200 million people or 10 million people, um, the value that is being created is often, you know, continues to grow exponentially in most of the case. Now we have seen movements around that, but in most of the case, it kind of follows an exponential growth. Thank you. Thank you, Erby. Thank you, Michelle, for the question. Um, Erby, if you have Couple of minutes. I wanted to ask a last question because I've seen this pattern in many of the questions from the audience. So I'm jumping, you know, taking Rajab's question, which was, "Do you think all these metaverse will merge into one large verse?" And there is also a Fabio Oliveira question, which is, "Do you think metaverses will have regional differences too?" And Didier also asked, "Is there still room for small players? So small metaverses or small brands?" In a way, I'm merging all these questions just for this last one, which is decentralization is at the core of the Web 3.0. But do you think that uh, won't we see some centralization as it happened over the last waves of the Internet? Or you do feel there is chance for small players, regional differences and so on? Great, great question. So the first thing is that... When we look at the acquisition, when we look at Facebook, their business model, they, they built one product, which was Facebook. Everything else was actually purchased, Instagram, WhatsApp, et cetera, at amounts that even back in the days, I mean, now it's considered, you know, 19 billion for WhatsApp would probably be something normal. Back in the days, I remember everybody was up in arms, thought it was a mistake, you know, like, but a lot of companies purchase it. The difference when it relates to Web 3.0 is that it cannot be purchased. You know, Decentraland with a market cap at 10 billion could have been purchased by Facebook in two seconds. But the reality is that there's no company, there's no, it's a decentralized organization. So therefore, Web 2.0 has a real problem is that it doesn't have an MA strategy for that. And that I think is the core of it all. When people are saying, you know, you have 90,000 owners all over the place, et cetera, it cannot be purchased. You can buy large pieces of land, like you can buy for billions of dollars of Bitcoins, you cannot buy the Bitcoin organizations. So therefore, it's the, 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 the users who actually, um, you know, the numbers of users that come in that create actually the, the value around it. So that's problem number one, is there's no m &A strategy right now. So right now, if you're the board of Facebook, they're gonna say, okay, well, we cannot purchase them. So we're gonna try to compete with it. Now you can say, 
Well, and what I suspect is going to happen, there's going to be bridges and they're going to say, you know what, we're going to buy a piece of land in all the different metaverse that there is, and we're going to create bridges. But that's also an issue because if you have 2 billion clients and you create a bridge with somewhere else, you have more chances of losing clients than gaining clients. So then you're also caught in a situation where it's like, is a bridge actually a good solution? And the short answer is probably not. Uh, but at the same time, I probably don't have the choice because people will ask for a bridge, even if it's companies that are smaller. So, so the same way that you had, you know, big fashion brands that would, you know, create an event on the metaverse because they're like, well, you know, there's a, a new clientele there. We need it. Although we're a much bigger brand, we actually need, you know, there's no equivalent of, of being there. So I think that is, is actually the, the first point. The second point is that um, again, I'm going to take the city analogy. I think that um, for me, you know, let's assume that a Decentraland, for example, is a New York City. It's the most expensive one. Is that where the most people are? It's the higher gas fees. Um, so a lot of people are going to gravitate around that environment. But it doesn't mean that you cannot start, you know, Greenwich, Connecticut, that you cannot start a, a city in, you know, the middle of Italy, that you're going to start a city, you know, like that doesn't mean one city is better than the other. It's just going to be just something different. It's going to be a different product. Now, you might have luxury brands that says, hey, I only want to be at what they call top tier cities uh, and often are going to say, you know what, I'm going to be happy in Scottsdale, Arizona. And, you know, I'm going to have my metaverse It's going to be a small metaverse It's going to be very niche. Um, then the issue becomes, is it, you know, a web 2.0, but, or web 3.0, but let's assume it's a decentralized one. It can be a small one with value through it to a specific community. And that is going to be successful. Not every city has to be Manhattan, London, or LA. You could have also the same way that not every layer one platform has to be Ethereum. You can have a Solana that might be more, you know, for NFTs, more creative, be more an LA type of city than, you know, Ethereum being a Manhattan type of city. And then you might have a Polkadot who might be more of a Chicago type of city, kind of like, you know, second tier in terms of finance, but good enough niche and, you know, good enough market. Then you can have a Washington DC who's, you know, like a horizon type platform, you know, so all of them, for me, I see it as all cities, there's going to be bridge between them, uh, the same way that there's, you know, airports between city, people bounce from one to the other. And um, I do believe that we're going to be into a multi environment, because it's not a web 2.0 of winner takes all, it's more going to be about different communities who are going to be successful in their own terms. Thanks a lot, Arvid, for the very detailed answer. And uh, I think, you know, this is a hot topic. And as you've seen, it generated a lot of questions. And I think this uh, proves uh, the success of your speech. Uh, you uh, left us with a lot of questions. And uh, uh, truth is, some of these, we're going to send them to you. And thanks again for your participation, for uh, bringing all this high quality content Again, I wanted also to thank you before uh, leaving the last words to you, Regina Ryan from Harvard Alumni Entrepreneurs, a huge partner of BAB, and Angie of STS Capitals. Uh, if you want to learn more about these organizations, just contact uh, uh, Luis. So thanks again a lot, Hervé. Uh, you know, your contacts are there. I think uh, you're going to let, you know, a lot of like LinkedIn invitations. And so uh, thanks again for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. Andrea, can you get the recordings, please? Is there a possibility? Yes, we're going to share the recording, I think. Uh, we have recorded the webinar. And uh, with uh, Hervé is OK, we're going to share it with the community. Yes. Thank you. That's a nice presentation. And Thanks, speech. Yeah, it was very really great. Thank Thanks, you. everyone, for being here. Have a great Thanks weekend. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, brilliant session. Thanks so much for being here over time as well. You're always welcome. And everybody that joined, Regina, Angie, huge thanks, all the members and guests. Uh, I wish you all an amazing weekend. Let's be in touch. Looking forward to, to keeping in touch with you all. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye -bye. Recording Bye -bye. stopped. Bye-bye.